right, so today we continue with volume 40A.1, the notion of Ditti in the titles on the whiteboard behind me. Now, all of us enjoy literature, right? We, we read literature books, story books, we, uh, even as children we share stories, and we watch TV shows. And, uh, and all these stories are very fantastic. They've got real characters. For example, if you watch soap operas, you might, you know, even get involved. You might laugh at this little video box, as they call it. Or you might cry if you see something sad. All you see on the TV is colors, shapes, lights, pictures. But we, we react to them. But we know they are not real. We, we know they, they are only imaginative, and we're very clear about that. It's not wrong about that. But, but there are some people, for example, you know, who, who watch Star Wars. They actually uh, they're so involved with Star Wars that some of them actually regard it like a religion. For example, they, they call themselves, uh, under religion, Jedi warriors. Okay, they, they worship the Jedi Knights. So I suppose to them that Jedi Knights are very real people in their heads. At least as real as you and I think of our gods. Or even the Buddha, if you like. We never met the Buddha. So we imagine, yes, he lived in the past. Of course, in the case of the Buddha, we have historical background. So it's not so difficult for us. But what about other things like Jataka stories of animals that talk? Stories of devas living in the heavens and all kinds of fantastic stories about monks flying here and there and so on. All these miraculous stories. Do we believe them or not? I think these are very difficult questions. And I know a lot of lots of Buddhists actually take this story to be true, like the history. But I think we have to look more deeply, more broadly about the nature of such stories as religion. No, I was just imagining before I give this talk, I said, if, I were, if, I, if we were living in Greece a thousand years ago, you know, the Greeks talk about Greek gods, Zeus and Apollo and all those gods, you know. Of course, in those days, a thousand, a thousand years ago, they would probably believe these gods existed. But today, if you ask uh, the modern Greek, I think most of them are unlikely to tell you they believe it, that these ancient gods actually exist. Then again, I could be wrong, because if you meet a Chinese, local Chinese or local Indian and, and, and you ask them, they have, they have their local religions, they might tell you that they believe in their gods too. So in a sense, everyone is right, if they believe in the gods, and the gods exist. So what is the Buddhist point here, in terms of right view, wrong view? Now, I must say, it's not, it's not an easy a topic to talk about, but we need to talk about this because we're talking about right view, about reality, uh, and, and this is going to figure a lot in how we live our life and whether we become enlightened or not, or whether we go on suffering. There's a very important, a very simple sutta in the book of Tools, the Dukkha Nipata, where the Buddha reminds us that there are two kinds of teachings in the suttas. One is the kind of teaching where the meaning is explicit, right? It's called uh, nitata. The meaning is very clear. For example, the Buddha says, uh, first of all, there is suffering, dukkha, and the second, noble truth, rising of suffering, third, noble truth, ending of suffering, and then fourth, noble truth, the path of the way. Right? So this is direct, very clear. So then there, there are stories about a certain person, stories about talking animals, stories about gods, devas and asuras fighting, and so on. So this is a second kind of stories which we should put that tell us. And we need to draw out the meaning from, from this second kind of story. Yeah? The meaning must be drawn out. It's called neyata, neyata. So from this teaching, we have a very good idea that uh, we must know how to evaluate, so to speak, how to evaluate the Buddha's teaching. 
if the idea is direct, yeah, we can take it like that, we can think about it, we can work on it. If there are stories, that means there are concepts being used. Man, woman, uh, gods, demons, right, and so on. Then you've got to ask yourself, what does this mean? What does this mean? So you've got to like put deeper into it. They are not a direct message, right? Now from there, you, you, you can already begin to have a very good idea how to set aside some of the things we are not sure about. Then there's another important uh, clue for us to understand fact from fiction, if you like. Now, what I'm saying here is, in a sense, I'm saying that the Buddha sometimes talks facts, sometimes he talks fiction. Useful facts, useful fiction. Why do we do that too in our daily life? We, 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 like now, I'm trying to tell you facts, truths. Sometimes I might tell you a story, right? We love people who tell stories, and we know the stories are not real. So it's fiction, but it's useful fiction, not useless fiction, right? So the question is, how do we deal with it? Right? So we have quite a number of talks here, because there's a very long article, about 50 pages here. So this is a very important topic. I'm going to like take my time talking about it. The second clue is very important. It's about meditation. No matter what we learn in meditation, uh, rather, no matter what we learn in, in our daily learning of Buddhism, when we go for talks, for example, in Buddhist books, or even a, like this kind of video talk, you know, watching and listening. Of course, we need to pay attention to what the talk is going on. That's the best way, even the only way, to get the information correctly. And from there, we build up our wisdom. But once you start meditating, you find that you have to let go of all these ideas and concepts and knowledge, no matter how wonderful they are. Because if you don't, you're going to distract yourself. That's what I mean when I say even Abhidharma must be let go of when you meditate. Because if you start thinking about Abhidharma when you meditate, you are meditating. So in meditating, you must let go of everything. When everything here means what? Your five senses. I, uh, no tongue, and body. That's the mind. Because that's what meditation is. Meditation is the real renunciation, the real letting go. You let go of your high physical senses. The body is why we sit very quietly, we let go of the body. And when our body is very peaceful, then we work on the mind. We let go of the mind, let go of views, clear away concepts, ideas, all the stories. The mind is very peaceful. Then when you come out of your meditation, when your mind is so peaceful and clear and calm, then you look at all these things you know again, and you find, oh yes, now they're clearer. They seem to fit better. It's just like driving, you know? I mean, you, you know the theory, the coach teaches you what to do. It's the first part. It's like you stop. And then you try yourself, you try the car yourself, right? That's like driving, you've got to do it yourself. And once you know how to drive, you find actually what you're instructed, you see, in a different, slightly different way, it's clearer to you. At that time before you, learn, you know how to drive, you, you thought the instructions were like this. But once you know how to drive and you're very good at it, you find it's much easier, so to speak. So this goes the same way when you study Buddhism. So in this sense, we have to understand the nature of views. Views are useful. Useful means they have a certain use, and you, you must know when they are useful, and you also must know when to let go of them. Yeah? And this is very clear from the whole idea of Buddhist training. As you know, Buddhist training, there are three kinds, right? Uh, sila, Samadhi, Panya. So they, they're like the three legs of a tripod, like this camera that is taking a video and sound of my talk. The three legs. So, the three trainings are the three legs of a tripod. So the first training is of the body. And body here includes speech, right? So all it is called moral training. You will train your body in speech. That's what the five precepts, especially. And then the, the purpose of this training of the body, to have a cultivated body, is so that we can cultivate our mind, which is a second training. The second training is that of mental concentration. 
And then these two, you put them together, is to build up our wisdom. So basically, that's a, very briefly, that's what the trick training is about. Now, if you look a little deeper, what, what does training in moral virtue entails? This is in section 111, in case you want to look up after the talk. So here, as we say, we've tried to understand our body and speech. Why is that so important? Why do we begin that? It's because our body is the source of all our knowledge. I have not said this before, but it's a very interesting statement, right? Our body is the source of all that we know. Actually, I have said this before, in different, in different words. Or rather, the Buddha has said this before, in the Sapa Sutta. Our body is the source of our knowledge. What does that mean? Whatever we know, we, on, we only know through our eye, ear, nose, tongue, and body. That's the body. And this, that's the source of our knowledge, is how we know things. So if that's all you know, definitely you must have full understanding and control of your body. Because if you don't, then these sources of knowledge will be haphazard. They will be giving you false knowledge, and it's going to cause us a lot of suffering if you do that. So, you have this, you have to understand the nature of the body like this. You have to respect this body. And that's what the precepts are about. The, the precepts make us human. The, the precepts keep us human. That's the minimum level of training you must have to remain on a human level. And uh, so, I mean, in other words, we must directly try to experience, understand what our senses are trying to tell us. What kind of knowledge are we gathering? Are we forming in our minds? Some can be true, some can be false, right? We cannot always depend on our senses. Why is that? Because our senses, all the five senses, don't function by themselves. The mind decides what we see, how we see. The mind decides, decides how we hear, what we hear, and so on. The mind makes sense of all these five kinds of sources of knowledge. So this is the second level of training training in concentration, right? So when your mind is calm and clear, then you begin to put together all this knowledge in a more systematic and clear and meaningful and useful and liberating way. So this second aspect of the training, in a sense, is to make proper use of this knowledge that we get through body and speech. Of course, we call it meditation. It is a modern word. Actually, meditation doesn't really reflect all this important functions are going on when, when we look at the mind. When you look at the mind, the first thing is you learn how to calm it down. The calming aspect means to make sure your body is at peace with itself. This knowledge is very clear. And at the same time, it's not bothering you at this point. That the clarity is you understand what's going on from all this knowledge that you get. It's on the second level of training, training of the mind. So, one of the best, very simple points to know whether you're doing it right or not in the second level of training is you feel happy. You feel at peace with yourself. You feel happy also means you feel safe. Feel safe means you basically know what's going on and there's no danger to your life at this point. You can do what you like and you're at peace with yourself. You're safe. It's a kind of a temporary ideal nirvana. You're safe. And then you feel happy. Right? So this idea of feeling happy is very important to know that you're doing your meditation right. Or that you're living your life rightly. You feel good and happy. Then again, a lot of people have a very wrong idea of happiness. They think happiness is excitement. They, they think that something must happen. You, I don't know what will happen. Often, very often when you say something happens, it's always something bad. You know? But if you are able to come here every week for sutta study, or you, you come here whenever you can, it means there is some space in your life. It means you can choose to do what you want to do. You're happy. Anytime you want, you can listen to a Dharma talk. You can meditate. You're at peace with yourself. Not many people have this opportunity. 
even if they have the opportunity to sit, they have a lot of free time. They, they just can't sit. They just have no inclination to learn the Dharma. They, they feel restless. They feel unhappy. Can you imagine what kind of suffering is that? Even if someone can be very rich, they might not be happy because they, they can't do nothing. In other words, it's just like the Buddha was sitting under this tree on very cold day, and then a young prince comes along and asks the Buddha, "Are you happy?" The Buddha says, "Yeah, I'm happy." The prince, how can you be happy? It's so cold, you know. The Buddha says, yeah, no problem. I my one rope. It's good enough because when you meditate, you feel warm also. And the Buddha asked the prince, now you, you are a powerful man, you know. But are you happy with all this power? And the prince talked about it and said, yeah, come to think of it. I have a lot of problems, you know. There's some rebellion coming out in the borderland. And I've got to make sure the politicians don't uh, fight, and, or, or worse, they don't, you know, house me from power. And then the women in the palace, there are so many women there, very nice, but then they start quarreling with each other and so on. It's really a big headache, you know. And yes, I'm wealthy, but then again, I've got to guard my wealth, other people will steal it and so on. So I'm to think of me, I'm not really that happy. The Buddha say, yeah, yeah, but look at me. I said, ah. The Buddha says, ah, all I have is my robe and my, my arms full, I'm very happy. And I, and I sleep happily and I, I'm happy just like that. I don't need all those things you have. So in other words, if you're truly happy just the way you are, without comparing yourself with others, you have true wealth. And this is something we must not take for granted. This wonderful peace we have is, yes, in a sense, the result of past good karma. But we've got to work hard now to make sure this peace is sustained. Why? So that we can learn things. So in a sense, uh, the learning process is the third level of training, the level of wisdom, if you like. Because on the level of wisdom, the third training, or panya, as they call it, we put together our knowledge through the body, our knowledge through the mind, on the second level, put them together and try to have a more clear, complete picture of what is going on with our lives. So then we have a direct experience of reality, right? So in other words, very often, we hear a lot of things from other people. That had knowledge. We never really think for ourselves. We never really experience things for ourselves. So in meditation, you begin to have a direct experience of reality with a mind that is calm and clear. As a result of meditation, you're able to experience reality more directly. You are not cheated by things around you. Your senses don't cheat you. You're more clear, more sharp, more wise, more creative, more observant. So here you have two aspects, creativity and uh, ability to solve problems, if you like. You know? Truth and beauty, if you like. So if your mind is calm and clear, you can, you're inspired by ideas. You, you see words, you, you just know how to put them together in a very beautiful way. If your mind is calm and clear, you look at issues and problems, people having problems, or you have a problem, your mind is calm and clear, you are in a better position to heal yourself, to heal others, to solve problems. These are the immediate benefits of, 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 of wisdom. But this provided you see reality directly. So here we're talking about views. So even at this early stage, we can see that there is wrong view, there's right view. There's a wrong way of viewing things, there's a right way of viewing things. Of course, on a very simple level, we can say when whatever we view through our senses, they are all impermanent. If we can think like that, we are quite safe. So let's just hold that thought for a moment like that. Okay? Now, Let's look at how the, the, the Buddha, uh, in his teachings, present his teachings on right views and wrong views. Imagine the Buddha, you know, he just got enlightened, and then he goes around teaching, you know, this, this story in his early life. He converted a lot of people, very intelligent people, old people, young people. So his first, the first group of people he uh, converted, if you like, the first 60 months, they were all arhats. 
they were full fledged saints, the minds were pure, they were all ready. In a sense, you might say they took many lives to prepare themselves. So when they heard the Buddha's teaching at once, they could connect. Right? Not, many people, not many people can do that. But there were some people, even though they came to the Buddha, or the Buddha came to them, they never responded. They never even bothered to become monks, not to talk about becoming streaminers or arahats. There are such people like that. So the Buddha is not that kind of like a magician who goes around, normally appears, people get converted. It's not, not quite like that. Of course, more people converted, we can sense when I met the Buddha, then those who did not, definitely. So when you look at the Buddha's life, uh, from my study of all the texts, I think we can helpfully divide his uh, ministry in other words, the 45 years of his teaching to two unequal periods. You have the first period. first period is about, let's say, at least the first 10 years of his ministry. Those 10 years were a very exciting time when he converted the great saints, the foundation of the Sangha, the true Sangha. And maybe 10, 20 years, if you like, first 10, 20 years. And then the last 25, 20 to 25 years, the second period. What's helpful? in uh, dividing the Buddha's ministry into two periods. Well, we, we can look at how the Buddha taught the Dharma. The first period, first 10 to 20 years, the Buddha used, if you like, the direct method. His language is very deep, very strange, no, no technical uh, points. In fact, he hardly talked about the kind of teaching we see today, like Four Noble Truth, Eightfold Path, Twelve Links, very neat, all the Twelve Links are there. I mean, you just imagine you, you, you meet a teacher, a great teacher, by chance. Maybe you're in India, you know, some holy place, not in Singapore. In Singapore, we, we go for nice talks in big halls, or we watch videotapes, talks like this. You know. I imagine you're in the Buddha, Buddha stand, you, you chance to meet the Buddha. You know. And the Buddha is not going to sit and give you a long lecture. He's going to look at you and he knows your mind, you know. And he's going to tell you just as enough teaching, just a short little teaching about the length of a sutta, you know what I mean? Right? Sometimes just one line, sometimes a bit longer. And that's going to hit you right where it really hurts, so to speak. In other words, it, it really fits your, your mentality on the spot. Suddenly you realize, wow, you know, I've realized the truth. And you just want to become a monk or a nun. So that's the first period. The Buddha knew just what to say to those people he met, to the five monks, and then to the three Kashapa brothers, to Yasa and his friends and so on. They were all ready. In a sense, they were waiting for the Buddha to tell them just the right thing. And this might be a really exciting period for the Buddha. I mean, you don't get that sort of thing today, you know, because today you find people collect teachings. They go here, they go there, and they say, oh, this teacher taught this, this, that teacher taught that, they compare, and they think they are better, they are more right than the other teachers, and so on. And nobody gets enlightened that way. So, the, well, it's not like that in the first period. There was this direct communication by the Buddha. But then, as the, the great saints started uh, gathering together, the Buddha did something really wonderful in his great compassion. Because there's so many people coming to join, to become monks and nuns, you know. So the Buddha alone could not handle them, but so many of them wanted to get a day. But the real reason was this, the Buddha only the Buddha is not someone who loves rituals. He, he, he doesn't perform rituals. Very simple ones perhaps if you can define those things as rituals. For example, you know, someone gets enlightened, let's say Angulimala, he realizes, oh, okay, you know, killing is wrong, so now I'm giving up all this nasty way of life. And he's a stream winner, so I want to become a monk. All the Buddha did was say, come, O monk, ehi bhikkhu. Or if there's many candidates, will say, eta bhikkhu, come, O monks. Or if there are nuns, Ehi Bikuni, it's recorded in Vinaya, that is this formula of Buddha called Kamam Namas. Or sometimes you might call a person for by the name, Ehi Baddha, you know, or Ehi Bande. So in other words, once the 
the saints are awakened and understand the teaching, there's no need of ceremony anymore. The Buddha only need to recognize them by saying, come. So they, just one word, they ordain as monks and monks. The word is simply, ehi, come. Eta, come, to a sense. Okay? This was the first 10, 10 years. Then there were many others who were not ready, who felt compelled, they were so inspired, they also want to join this Sangha, they want to learn. And the Buddha allowed them to join. Why? Because if they were not monks and nuns, they probably messed their lives really bad. Like Devadatta is one extreme according to Theravada tradition. And there were many other monks who were simply, you know, look for loopholes in Vinaya, for example. The Buddha was very compassionate with them. So the Buddha allowed the monks to ordain these kind of candidates. Of course, there were many, much more good ones, great uh, arahats, great monks and monks. So the Buddha allowed the monks themselves as a body to ordain. Now, if, you, if you're a lawyer, if you know, if you study law, you will find this aspect of the history of the Sangha very interesting. But this is where the Buddha allows the Sangha, it, it empowers the Sangha as a body to perform an act. It's called a communal act, Sangha act, or technically legal act. Today we have what's called a parliamentary act, something like that. In fact, the parliamentary act and the, the rituals of the Sangha are very similar. For example, there's one kind of ordination, the latest kind of ordination, the kind that I was ordaining many decades back. It's called the Nyati Chattuta Kamma. In other words, the, the communal act or the Sangha act that has got the motion as number as the fourth. So there are three uh, like readings, presentations, say, okay, here's this candidate, copy your seal, here's the amount for the first time I'm saying it. And if you have no objections, then okay, I take it as a yes. And it's the second time I'm saying it, third time I'm saying it. And the fourth time the motion is carried. So you've got the three readings, one motion. So this is a very uh, ancient kind of uh, what you call act, if you like, where the Buddha empowers the Sangha to ordain the monks. And, and, and because of this, you find a lot of People joined the order and became monks and nuns. So this was second period. Okay? Of course, it also means that the Buddha has opened the door wide for anyone you know, to join. But as you know, as the Sangha grew more successful, the more donors, more supporters, nicer place to stay, then more and more people who are not really sincere also joined the order. For example, you know. I was working on volume 43, and I am working on volume 43. The first, first article is on Jiwaka. This famous doctor, uh, he, he's one of the earliest doctors in Indian traditional medicine. He's so good in healing, he does operations on people. First time you ever heard of it. Imagine the first time they were, he did stomach operation, open up the stomach, and then straighten out the bowels of this person who was an acrobat. Then he cut open the skull and removed a couple of worms on another person's head. And he did operation on some kind of uh, fistula or, or bleeding wound in King Dibisara. He was this kind of surgeon. So he became very knowledgeable and effective. Of course, he took care of the Buddha also. And when people heard that he was healing a lot of people, free of charge, especially the monks, and the Buddha, they also, they, they are sick people, you know, so they joined the order also. They had leprosy, they had all this uh, tuberculosis and other, all these terrible diseases. So much so that this uh, poor doctor found he just couldn't manage it anymore. So he tells the Buddha, can you please make it a rule that people with this falling diseases, you know, uh, with, with tuberculosis, with, with uh, leprosy, and so on, all these communicable diseases, they're not allowed to join the cup monks. Because they're not really interested in becoming monks, they just want to get a free uh, service, if you like. You know? So the, then the Buddha made a rule, okay, because of this doctor's request. So you find there are many such rules made to prevent false candidates, if you like. 
So this has been the second period. So because these people had wrong views, very bad wrong views about the Sangha and about themselves, about spirituality even. But yet, the Buddha, his compassion, allowed his, uh, the, allowed anyone who is uh, qualified, anyone willing to learn, to join the order, to become a member of the Sangha, so that they have a good chance of getting awakening in this life itself. So this idea of awakening in this life itself is still real today. As long as you can hear suttas, you can keep precepts, you can meditate, the chance of, being, of awakening in this life is real and possible. And I must tell you, I know it is possible for myself too, and I wish you would feel the same way if you understand this. I cannot understand how people can be a member of any religion, especially Buddhism, and yet not believe that I can be enlightened in this life. Somebody has been discouraging them. Somebody has been teaching them the wrong things. Because when you hear the Dharma, basically, you should be able, at least in your mind, you say, I want to be enlightened in this life. I can be enlightened in this life. So, one way is, of course, to understand the nature of views. So coming back to this, the way the Buddha uh, has been teaching, you find that in the first 10 years, he communicates in a direct, non-dual way. He gives his teachings directly. Almost a mind-to-mind -mind communication. Sometimes the, the, the words that he use, it seems as if only the listener understands. For example, uh, to a certain wise person, he said, this is it. There is this, or this is it. Now, if you and I listen, what, what does this mean? Uh, and then second, the Buddha says, there is this low thing, there is this high thing, and there is the way. Of course, you know, the Four Noble Truths, you say, oh yeah, the Buddha is talking about Four Noble Truths. So sometimes the Buddha does not specifically say Four Noble Truths, he just say the basic idea, this wise person understands it. Because if you say this is it, we're talking about life, this is life, First Noble Truth. There is unsatisfactoriness everywhere. So those people were ready, but they could understand it during the first period. Right? But there are, of course, many others who couldn't understand the Buddha. They need longer teachings, longer explanations, or they need to follow examples from, from others. So here you find many you know, such people in the second period, the, the, the last 20 to 25 years of the Buddha's time. So here we can already talk about different kinds of people. Right? So in other words, you have the quick learners, the quick learners are those who could understand the Buddha's teaching at one hearing. So you can say almost all the great saints of the first period, the five months, up to Mokalana, Sariputta, and Yambas, they were like that. They were very quick to listen. They hear something, sad, they call it. Okay? So these are called the Ukati Tanyu. Yeah? This is in section 1.3.2. These are the quick learners. So once the Buddha has this kind of people who are quick learners or great teachers, he sent them out to teach others. And so they became the first missionaries, true missionaries. And Buddhism became the world's first true missionary religion. Now this is very significant if you consider this was 2,500 years ago, when people don't really go around teaching their religion so freely. In fact, it, the Brahmins do not allow anyone to join their group. The Brahmins, it's like, uh, what shall I say, it's like a family country club. You can't join. No matter how much money, you can't join. You've got to be born into the family. As a Brahmin, then you can join. But the Buddha just reversed the table. He said, anyone can join this order of mind, the Sangha. The important thing is, you must want to awaken in this life. In that sense, Buddhism is the first missionary religion. And uh, what is this mission? This mission is to help us open our eyes to see reality directly. You can say that's the first and the only purpose in Buddhism, if you like, 
to help us see through reality. Everything else is secondary, in other words. Now, once you understand in this way that we need to cultivate right view, and right view is the first of the, uh, first of the eightfold path, you begin to understand that Buddhism actually is a very simple religion, at least in theory. Of course, in practice, you have your choice. Right? You can keep precepts, you can do your meditation, you can do your But sooner or later, you must understand the nature of views. So here, to simplify things, what the, the Buddha talks about, the four noble truths. The four noble truths are the easiest, safest way of, of having right views, if you like. So if you look at life, what do you see? View, right? Seeing, viewing. What do you really see? You see that a lot of people around you, not just people, any living being, they are all in the process of evolving, changing. There's always something they need, something missing. We all have something missing here. I mean, if you know Buddhism, you're already awakened, you won't be here. If I'm already awakened, I probably won't be here too. I'll be in the forest. Right? So we all, there's still something missing in our lives. There is still something we are looking for. This is another way of looking at the first noble truth. There is still something missing in our life, a lack, ignorance. And then we, we try to understand how did this lack arise, right? Of course, through ignorance, through craving. And of course, through Buddhism, we know that there is a way out. The way is to understand the nature of this inner peace. And when you extend this idea of inner peace, that it, it lasts longer and more. It is a permanent things in nirvana. And then finally, there is this way of doing it, a way to attain this nirvana. So this is a usual sequence we get when we think of the Four Noble Truth, right? You've got the truth, and then the arising, the ending, and then the way, right? Or dukkha, suffering, and then the arising is a craving, and then the ending is nirvana, and then the path, no way for path. Again here, yeah, that's not right view, you see, because occasionally, in some rare suttas, you find actually, sometimes, number three and four are switched around, you see. So you have the first number truth, second number truth, and then you have the way, and then nirvana. Okay? I came across one such sutra in volume 43. And it makes sense, because if you talk of the four noble truth as suffering, arising of suffering, and then the path, it's a practical approach. That's how we will practice. And then you have the nirvana. So nirvana is last, right? Because have you ever noticed and thought about how come nirvana is second last, you know, not last? Because nirvana is a goal, you see? But it's because of theory. When the Buddha presents the four noble truth as theory, He's like inspiring us. You know? It's just like we are. We, I love to go much in the so I bring some of my friends along, and then we take the bus, and then we reach the, the town. We get down, and then we walk to the forest, and then you can see the mountain far away. And then suddenly, my friends feel like going home. They say, "Oh my goodness, so far away!" I say, "Yeah, it's seven miles." I say, "Seven miles, not very far. You walk, you know." So uh, they, they see the, the mountain. You know? So you see the mountain, but you're not there yet. You see. So you've got to walk, you know, right? So that the four noble truth, you've got to walk to the mountain. So there you are, that's one way of looking at the four noble truth. Another way is in terms of practice, where you put nirvana last. So there again, it's a lesson that we must not have too much fixed views in Buddhism. At this point, I can you know, safely tell you, just remember a very simple point here. All views are provisional. All views are provisional. No matter what you hear from the best teachers that you have met anywhere in Singapore, especially in Singapore, all their views are provisional. Provisional means what? Take it like that. Don't take it too seriously. Take them like rounds of a letter. If they, they make you happy, if you feel good about it, good. Just hold on to it. 
there's no reason to throw it out if, you, if it makes you feel happy. It should not make you feel wicked or angry or upset when someone else tells you you're wrong. If, 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 if you feel like that, then it's that view is not right. So you have to start examining why you feel like that. So if you have no reason to let go of this, you start you hold on to it. But then as you study Buddhism, as you reflect, you begin to notice, oh yes, there's another way of looking at this. You begin to see a bigger picture. And then you find, naturally, you can let go of those old views because this new view is so clear, you don't need old views anymore. Okay? So, all views are provisional because they help us to understand ourselves better, in other words. So, the, the Buddha knows, gives us a, a very systematic way of teaching, and uh, ultimately, when we understand all this, at some point where we feel we understand something so well, here's a very wonderful clue. When the right understanding can help you and you can have a good idea, it is right understanding. Let's say you hear talk, especially when you go for retreats. You, this teacher gives you a talk number one, the teacher's voice and demeanor are very peaceful. Right? You don't frighten you. You don't go around knocking your head or cutting off your fingers and so on. You know, they don't do that. You know, those are against the rule. I can't imagine the Buddha doing that. And you feel so peaceful when you hear this kind of talk. And then after that, your mind is so peaceful, you don't think about anything anymore. You just feel like meditating. In other words, your mind has achieved a certain inner silence. You have temporarily become a muni. M U N Y N I, M U N I, Muni, the silent sage. Muni is a very ancient word used to describe the Buddha. Because when the Buddha got enlightened, his mind was clear, so peaceful, so happy. That's why he spent seven weeks, you know, 49 days, enjoying this wonderful bliss. Because once he gets out of that meditation, if he wants to teach the Dharma, all these ideas have to start coming back and he has to like, sort them out and then teach the Dharma. So he wants to enjoy the peace for a while. So anyway, where we are concerned, when we listen, you might listen to this talk after a while, you feel very peaceful. Or any time you feel peaceful, just shut down this videotape for a while and do your meditation and you feel really good. Then, in many ways, my job is done, so to speak. So, this is one test, whether this view is suffer or not. It brings you peace of mind. A view is good and true because in the end you don't need it anymore. It's just like good food, you know, you don't argue over good food, you don't talk about good food, you eat it, you know. And once you eat it, you feel very good and nice. There's no more food left, right? So views are like that. So. How can we come back to a simple level of use? How can we understand whether we are practicing Buddhism correctly? We are right due to the Buddha's teaching. And the Buddha does give us a lot of clues here, how to, in a sense, uh, keep our body and mind on the right track so that we don't have wrong views. Uh, one one uh, very simple uh, model, if you like, teaching model, is called uh, the graduated talk or the, or the progressive talk. This is found in session 2211. Right? When the Buddha talks about uh, here, I'll just read to you this passage from the Vinaya and other places. Then the Blessed One gave him a progressive talk. That is to say, he spoke on giving, moral virtue, the heavens. He explained the danger, the vanity, and the disadvantages of sensual pleasures, and the advantages of renunciation. When the Blessed One perceived that the listener's mind was prepared, pliant, free from obstacles, elevated and lucid, lucid means clear, then he explained to him the teaching peculiar to the Buddhas, that is to say, suffering, is arising, its cessation, and the path. So here you can see the teaching style of the Buddha. 
First, you talk about general things, simple things like giving, being charitable to others. You may not be a great saint, you may not be a good meditator. You can do something simple. Anyone can do that. Be charitable. Be generous to others when you can. If you can afford to be charitable, that means you are already enjoying good karma. If you are, if you have the means of being charitable and you don't be, behave charitably, then you are eating what's called uh, stale food. We saw already Vishaka said of it, of it. It's perfectly In other words, we, we, we are rich and all the good karma is there, but we, we don't continue to do good deeds, then, you know, we're just being propelled like a shooting star to let the light go out. So we continue doing good, good things by being charitable to others, being kind to others. And next thing is not just being charitable, but also keep the precepts. Right? It's not, not enough just to donate millions of dollars to build a school or some or another temple. Or you must also be charitable, and so you must keep the precepts, right? Because when you keep the precepts, then you are continuing to be a human inside you. And the Buddha talks about the heavens, here heavens and so on. To me, it's a thing that meditation. We come back to the three trainings again. When you practice the precepts for to control your body and speak, it makes you human. The five precepts I've spoken again and again keeps you human, so that you don't fall below the human state, subhuman state of the animal, asuras, pretas, and the hell being. If you regularly, habitually enjoy breaking the precept, you're going to fall into those states even in this life. And in the next life, you're going to continue being reborn in those states. But if you keep the precepts well, your body is safe, you're in control of it, then in meditation, what happens is you uplift yourself to the divine level. For example, loving kindness. Loving kindness is called the divine above. Brahma Vihara. You don't have to go to heaven to be like Brahma. In this life itself, you practice loving kindness. You practice the four divine abodes. Loving kindness, compassion, gladness, and equanimity. You cultivate divinity in this life here and now. Heaven is not a place you go to. Heaven is a place you cultivate within yourself. This is the true meaning of the temple of God is within you. The temple of Brahma is within you. Okay. So cultivate within you. Not by worshipping, not by praying, but by cultivating all these wonderful qualities of the divine abodes. So that's the, the heavens. And then the Buddha, once a, when the Buddha talk like this, if you're happy, it's only nice, it's wonderful, I can do this. Then you feel very happy, then the Buddha goes on to talk something more serious. So yes, we are lay people enjoying our essential pleasures. Then what are the problems with essential pleasures? Well, since pleasures are very nice when you have them, but what you have, you're going to lose. And when you lose them, you feel bad, you suffer, you know, and so on, right? So that's the, the gratification is, you, you think it is fun, you know. The danger is you're going to lose it, and then and when you lose it, you're going to suffer. So if you understand this, then if you are able to distance yourself from this kind of, uh, what you call, give and take or push and pull kind of uh, situation, then you won't suffer. But there is a deeper meaning to renunciation here. Not everybody can become monks and nuns. It's the Buddha telling all these people, say, uh, you become monks and nuns, and there's so many people out there. If everybody becomes monks and nuns, what's going to happen? Not possible, right? So there's a deeper meaning to renunciation here. Come back to what I said earlier. The real meaning of renunciation is not just changing your hairstyle and then your clothes, you know. It is changing your whole personal habit. Instead of accumulating more things, more wealth, more title, you learn to renounce, inner renunciation. Renouncing attachment to body and speech. Renouncing attachment to the mind in meditation. And you feel so happy and you come back again in this way. Even as a layman, you function better as a layperson when you understand the nature of true renunciation. 
So this is a reflection on this verse on the progressive talk by the Buddha. Of course, the, the Buddha would talk to the firstly to the monks because the monks they have socially given up their ties to family, money, power, and so on, and and they are ready. So the Buddha talk them first because they are like the best field that uh, for a farmer to plant things. They are at peace with themselves. They are ever ready to listen to the Buddha. Here, we all have maybe, you know, once a week only they can come here, but even then, you know, sometimes we don't have a chance to do so. And when we move around with other groups, we find not always have a chance to know the suttas. We are always doing someone else bidding it. There's some projects, some plan, and we just follow up, we just do things. And we say, we're working for the Dharma, actually, we're working for this organizer. But when do we really get to do the practice ourselves? Not very often. So to be a monk is wonderful, you know. You can practice every day. I live in a retreat center before. You find uh, after meal time, all the monks go back to their kutis, to their places to rest a while, and then they are practicing on their own things like that. So anytime, every time they are practicing. In a sense, as a layman, you can do that too. You know, I mean, you can become a full-time lay Buddhist worker. You can create this kind of environment. Be very close in the way a, a, a true man would live. It's possible. Or you can live by yourself, and if you understand the Dharma, you will know what to do. You're happy with yourself. It's when you have inner happiness that you are able to live by yourself. You can be alone even in a crowd. You're happy even alone or in a crowd. Because your happiness is always inside you. You're always safe, like a tortoise. Right? So here the Buddha uses a very beautiful uh, parable of the tortoise. Yeah? He says, be like a tortoise. And the jackal, this very dangerous animal, comes hunting to kill the, look for food, kill the tortoise and eat it. Pull in the, all the four legs eh? and the head also pull in. And then everything is closed, the shell is closed. Then the tortoise is safe from this jackal. This is like understanding how your five senses work. There are times you just got to like go of the five senses as well. So this tortoise with all the four limbs and the head inside the shell, you look at it next time, you tell yourself, this is a symbol of meditation. When you meditate, you know, you just put in all your five senses. Why? Because you want to go on a mental level, you want to go on a divine level of experience. So, coming back to the Four Noble Truths, you find this uh, Four Noble talks about, uh, in the sense of to view the world rightly, and uh, this is where, this is what the Buddha talked about to the five monks. Of course, there's a problem here. You remember I told you earlier that during the first 10 years, the Buddha taught the Dharma in a very simple way, not using very deep concepts. There were no technical terms, even something like the Four Noble Truths. So how does the first sermon or first discourse fit in here? These are those problems some scholars have talked about. It is possible that uh, no one remembered, and no one except the five monks and perhaps those close to the five monks remembered what the Buddha taught the first time. We've got to ask ourselves, we've got to imagine when did all the suttas get compiled? Perhaps during the second period, maybe at the earliest point, maybe when Ananda was around. So he started remembering all these uh, suttas. Definitely by the first council, even by Asoka's time, all these teachings were compiled. So imagine that when these monks got together and they started compiling the, all those years of the Buddha's teaching. Imagine the first council, they were compiling 45 years of the Buddha's teaching. And then they asked around and said, anyone remembers the first teaching the Buddha gave? I'm not sure whether the five monks were there or not, because they were very old, you know, some of them could have passed away. So nobody remembered the first sermon, you know, first discourse. So perhaps they'll be wondering, hmm, the Buddha must have taught some of these basic teachings, you know. So when, when they look around the suttas, they found, okay, you have the, this is how the Buddha taught the, the Four Noble Truths. And then they, they put it together, it's a very simple structure, and they call it Dhammachaka Sutta. 
have one important clue. We have why they probably did this is because where the sutta was located. The sutta is S fifty six point eleven. I mean, it's not an easy number to remember. You know, this first discourse is located somewhere right in the middle of the Sangutta Nikaya, you know, chapter fifty six. You know? I mean, if it is really important number one, wouldn't they have given it, you know, kind of very important place? So here is probably like an afterthought, you know, because they did thought, oh, you know, we better record something, what we would have teach in the first discourse. Oh, I'm not saying that the teaching is false, I'm saying that they have to make an effort to recall some kind of teaching that they gave to the first month. The important thing here is the spirit of the Dharma is there. So here again, my point is all teachings are provisional. It doesn't matter whether did the Buddha teach the four uh, noble truth in the first discourse or not, he may well have taught it, he, he, maybe he did not teach it, we don't know, it doesn't matter. If you think too much about this, you can't meditate. On the other hand, if you're a meditator, you find it doesn't really matter. We know the Buddha taught the four noble truth, that's good enough. Even if I can prove to you, yes, write a PhD thesis on the Buddha did teach the first discourse in this way to the five months, well, it's fine, you know. But it's not going to help you in your meditation. So, views are interesting, it is like something to talk about, but take them as professional elements. Therefore, the, the first discourse is useful in the sense that it reminds us to avoid extremes, but the hateful part, things like that. So it's useful in that sense. So in short, the Buddha's teaching is a path. A path means you've got to walk it, you've got to follow it. And when you walk on the path, you've got to open your eyes. Right? If you do medit walk, walking meditation, you know that very well. There are some people, you know, who feel so good about walking meditation, they, they try to do it with their eyes closed. Now you're doing a lot of fine, you know? but if there are people around you, you can't. You're not into others. So when you do what walking meditation, you need to open your eyes. Yes, but you look down the floor in front of you so that you don't get distracted. So in other words, we need to look where we are going. So in a sense, uh, when we apply the three trainings again to this walking, we find that uh, when your eyes are open, you know your surrounding. That's like keeping the first training your body and speech, you know where your body is, you're silent, you're preparing to walk. And then you start walking, but you need focus, your direction. You, know? you walk up to the other end, you come back, so the second stage of training, if you like. At the end of it, you feel very nice, very peaceful. There's a third stage of training, something like that. Yeah? So, again here, it's not a question of faith. It's a question of practice. You practice, you feel good, you feel joyful, and you have faith in that practice. That kind of faith is okay. That's called effective faith. Faith arising through your practice, and you feel very happy, very joyful on account of that. This kind of faith nobody puts into you. You experience yourself through your own meditative experience. The other kind of faith Someone tells you so, you better believe this, and these are the things you must do, okay? Especially with your choice. That's cognitive faith, right? So that kind of faith is not important. In fact, that kind of faith is used to manipulate people. And that's the kind of faith we try to avoid in Buddhism. So when you practice with right view, you also have this beautiful experience of joy and peace. And this wonderful faith through your joy arises. So you find right view changes your conduct. It makes you a better person. It makes you more peaceful. It makes you more joyful. So right view is not having views. Right view is the ability to let go of all views and be happy. So on that note, I will stop today. Then we continue further. We're going to look at this nature of this faith and continue from there in the next part two hours. Study, yeah? Okay, any questions? Okay, then let us do a short reflection.
Uh, today we begin. Uh, we are beginning our study of Volume 40A, Part One. Over the last seven, eight years, we have put together so many volumes because of all your efforts in supporting our demo work here. Without you all, all these 40 volumes is impossible. To put the suttas together in such a systematic way takes a lot of effort. The main fuel for all this effort is joy. Without Dhamma joy, we can never sustain ourselves, spending thousands, hundreds of thousands of hours with all these suttas. To bring it back, to make it meaningful for people today who can read it, and people all over the world enjoy the suttas. Because the notes are very detailed. And we connect all the teachings together. And then we practice them and we find it's connected with our teachings. So these suttas are meditation-based sutta. That is why the sutta discovery is so effective and people love it. But the power of all such good thoughts, may we attain mental peace in this life itself. May our, may our meditation bring peace and wisdom to us even here and now. And in the peace of the moment, let us send out our loving kindness to all those people who have given us the Dharma, to our loved ones. May they be well, may they be happy. Even to those who are inimical to us, may the Dharma may touch them, they will be good and kind people, and growing wisdom. And most important of all, may in this life itself we attain spiritual liberation, namely string wing. May all beings be well and happy. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.